I know there's a lot of interest nowadays in heart rate variability. Increase that number. Confusing stuff. The science is not there. Is that superpower? Heart rate variability has become one of the most talked about metrics in the health and fitness industry. It's a metric that holds the potential to tell you not just how well you've adapted to your training, but also how well you slept, how stressed you are, and whether you might be getting ill. And nowadays, pretty much all the consumer wearables track it, and it's one of the main metrics used to calculate your readiness or recovery scores. But how accurate are these HRV values from these wearables? To find some answers, I've spent an inordinate amount of time researching this and talking to some of the leading experts and practitioners in the field. And with their help, I want to take you step by step through the process of measuring your HRV and show you some of the most common pitfalls of HRV tracking and how you can prevent them. Because as of right now, it seems that most of us are not measuring it accurately and are not using the data to its full potential. The first step and the first pitfalls happen when you're choosing your measuring device. The gold standard for HRV measurements is electrocardiography or ECG in short, which uses electrodes to detect the electrical activity of the heart. We've come a long way from uh, the first ever ECG because the, the first ever ECG, which was developed in the early 1900s, weighed uh, 300 kilograms, required you to submerge your arms and a leg in a saline solution and had to be operated by five technicians. But nowadays, most chest strap heart rate monitors like this Polar H10 work using ECG. They have electrodes at the back of the strap, which measure the voltage changes on your skin and hence detect your heart's electrical signals. However, most sport watches and fitness wearables like this Suunto Race and this Overring do not use ECG. Instead, they use an optical measurement technique called photoplethysmography. Did I get that right? Or PPG in short. The wearable shines light through your skin and tracks blood flow based on the amount of light absorbed. One of the things with PPG is that it's uh, like um, sensitive to motion artifacts, right? Yeah, so, that, so the optical sensors are very noisy, uh, meaning that any sort of minimal disruption will mess up the data. Like if you type at your computer or scroll with, with your phone, like the minimal muscle tension will make the PPG data become complete garbage. If you compare um, ECG, so these these like blips that you normally see on, on a TV show to PPG, which is the thing on your on, your, on the wrist when a, a smartphone measure, it's like a world of difference in terms of signal quality and, and clarity, so, so to say. So, so here's a study where they test tested six different wearable devices for estimating sleep, heart rate, and heart rate variability. And in this study, uh, Whoop was the most accurate one, and the worst performing one was the, the Garmin. And just to put the accuracy into perspective, let's say that ECG measured your heart rate variability to be 50 milliseconds. The Whoop on average would have given you a value of 45.5 milliseconds. Then again, the Garmin on average would have given you a value of 27.6 milliseconds, so like half of the actual value. But the, the poor results from the Garmin might be because Garmin used a three minute manual test just prior to sleep which is an interesting way to measure HRV. That sounds pretty bad, but the tested wearables were at least one to three generations behind current technology. For instance, the Garmin Forerunner 245 Music was launched five years ago. And this seems to be a pretty common problem with research related to wearable technology. By the time a paper is published, the device it studied is often already outdated, discontinued, or at least replaced by a newer version. In fact, one study estimated that only about 4% of all the wearables in the market at the moment are validated. Even though the, the absolute values from these wearables weren't super accurate, the wearables have generally demonstrated very high relative reliability, meaning that even though the absolute HRV value from the wearable might be a bit lower because they tend to have a negative bias. The day-to-day -day changes and overall trends seem to correlate very well with an ECG. It could be that there is a bit of an absolute value difference when we measure the absolute value, but then in relative changes, they track extremely well. And also finally, Rob has done some extensive testing on the most current versions of these variables, and his results have been very promising. Also for this second night, we see a very good agreement between the reference device and the aura ring. So overall, also for HRV, we seem to see a very good agreement between the aura ring and the reference device. So long story short, I think for the vast majority of people, the two signals are extremely similar. 
And uh, I myself use the phone camera on an iPhone, so if I was concerned with the quality, I would use a strap. Okay, then we move on to step two, which is taking the actual HRV measurement. First of all, the big question is whether you should do a nighttime measurement or a morning measurement. Most wearables nowadays give you a nighttime measurement automatically, and they can seem very convenient, but there are a few things you should know about them. For one, um, of course, you need to be wearing the measurement device on you throughout the night. And some people might find it pretty irritating, especially if you're using like a big sports watch like this. And also very few of us would like to sleep with a chest strap on. So ECG isn't really a feasible option for nighttime measurements, which can bring the accuracy down. Also, if you're taking a nighttime measurement, you need to make sure that your wearable is taking measurements throughout the night. Most wearables, like the Aura Ring, take measurements every five to 10 minutes. But for instance, the Apple Watch only measures your HRV at few random points during the night. And these kinds of sporadic measurements can be affected by at least three things. First of all, your circadian rhythm tends to increase HRV during the night. This means that the measurements taken earlier in the night tend to be lower than the measurements taken later in the night. HRV is also affected by sleep stages. So the values will differ, let's say, between REM sleep and deep sleep. And if you happen to be moving or tossing around, the PPG uh, measurement will be inaccurate. So Aura is telling me that I got uh, 5 hours and 33 minutes of sleep. But I think the reason for that is that uh, it has these massive gaps in data starting from like 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. So I realized I need to actually look at the, the data and the graphs that my Aura is giving me each night and see whether there are any artifacts or um, errors in the data. Because for instance, a night like this where like 30 to 40 percent of data is just missing, I can't really use this this data. Now, if we think about the morning measurements, morning measurements fix most of the issues with, with nighttime measurements because you are in control of all the variables. There's no effect from the circadian rhythm or sleep stages, and you can make sure that you're not moving around at all. Now, furthermore, and, and this is like the more convincing reason for me to use morning measurements, is that morning measurement might capture some things that the nighttime measurements can't. That the morning is the best time because it's further away from the stressors. So if we train in the evening or if we eat late or if we drink something, it will be a greater impact in my data simply because you are measuring very close to the stressor. So let's say you train in the evening because you have a stress reaction, your HRV is suppressed. Night measurement wouldn't really tell you how you reacted to that stress because the stress is still ongoing during the measurements. Only morning measurement would then tell you how how both the training and the sleep, which are both part of the, the stress and recovery that we are trying to assess, uh, only the morning measurement would then tell the effect of both of those things. But of course, if you decide to use morning measurements, you need to come up with a protocol or routine that you stick to every time you take the measurements. How long do you think the HRV recording should be for like optimal data? I think that for a morning spot check, it is fine to measure for one minute. And then I, I read your blog post, so there are some also some confounding factors. One, one of them like was really surprising to me that like swallowing can affect it. Right. Here's a graph from Marco. He was testing the effect of swallowing on his heart rate variability. And there's all, all kinds of weird things happening. His heart rate variability doubles from 41 to 81. And I've also had similar results with my own measurements. And also breathing patterns have an effect on HRV. So one of the challenges is that you should try and breathe the same way every time. One way to do that is to use a metronome, but some people find it rather unnatural to breathe with a metronome. And also no drinking water, right? And I, right, that's another one. So here's a study where they tested water consumption. And the result is basically that the more they drank, the more their heart rate variability increased. And apparently this increase in heart rate variability can last for up to like 90 minutes. It's a very long lasting effect. So based on my chat with Marco, a general outline for an optimal routine for measuring your HRV in the morning could be something like this. First of all, you should take the measurement first thing when you wake up, but you can and probably should go to the toilet before the measurement. Then you should take the measurement either laying down or sitting and sitting might be a better option if you're rather fit. Then your reading should be about one to two minutes long, not shorter than one minute. And if you go longer than two minutes, there isn't really that much additional benefit. You should try and breathe normally. And if that's difficult, you could use a metronome. And finally, try not to move 
swallow or talk. Well, no, no movement whatsoever. For someone like me, it's uh, it's at least not not an option when I like my morning uh, routine is that I have a, a three year old that uh, starts hitting me and uh, yells, "Dad, Dad, go! We need to go and read a book. We need to go read a book." So there's no time to, <laughs> to if I would make a HIV reading at during that moment, it wouldn't be that useful. I think. Exactly, ex exactly. There are uh, situations or environments where you cannot have this kind of protocol that where you can always make it exactly the same so for instance for you it probably is much better to use the the night time measurements so then we get to probably the most difficult part of this whole hrv measurement process the interpretation of the data first and foremost if you're just starting to track your hrv you need to set the normal range for your hrv meaning what are the normal values through which your hrv uh, varies. How much data do you think you would need to set the normal range? A minimum of four weeks. The reason is that if we take shorter time, say a week, then maybe if something happens that shifts your physiology, um, like you are sick for three, four days, and then if your normal day, normal range is just a week, then your normal will become the sickness. And of course, that doesn't make sense. And also make sure that the app you're using to analyze your, your data shows the normal range. Because what I've noticed is that, is that many, many of the apps do not even show that. Generally, people think that a higher HRV or an increasing HRV uh, is a good thing. But I remember some, in some of your blog posts, you said that it's not always the case. Yeah, that's right. I think that you have a certain range in which things are going well. And outside of that range, maybe there is something where we need to pay more attention. And that means that higher isn't better, but the normal is where you want to be, normal is good. People also often think that HRE should be lower after a hard training day. Do you think that's true? I think that if you see a suppression, typically it's due to the fact that you overexerted yourself. So it was just a mismatch between your ability and the stimulus. Otherwise, within the hours that pass from the stressor to the measurement, including assuming you measure in the morning, including sleep and everything, you should bounce back to normal with the exception of cases in which there are also other stressors. Also, HRV isn't very valuable as a singular metric. It needs context. Usually you would want to connect it to something else, like find out what caused periods of prolonged HRV um, and see, can I predict that in some way? For instance, you could look at other metrics like your training load or your sleep duration, or you could gather some more subjective data with a questionnaire where you score your, let's say, stress levels or mood or energy every day. And then you could see how those things are affecting HRV. And for that, I created a morning survey that I'm gonna fill in right when I wake up and an evening survey that I'm gonna fill in just before I go to bed. In the morning survey, I basically have two metrics that I'm gonna rate on a scale from one to 10. First one is uh, energy and the second one is excitement. And then in the evening, I'll rate stress, fatigue, soreness, mood, and then I'll also give a score uh, to the day for the day. This 2022 study gives a very good example of how to provide context to HRV and how to use it in your training. So they had two different training groups. First group had a predefined training plan and the other group had an individualized training plan, which basically was adjusted twice a week. In addition to heart rate variability, they were also measuring perceived fatigue and, and soreness based on a questionnaire and heart rate running speed index or your heart rate at a given speed. And for each of these metrics, they were looking for red flags. If there were no red flags, they increased the load. If there was one red flag, they maintained the load. If there was two or more red flags, then they decreased the load. And then twice a week, they would adjust their training based on the number of red flags that they, they were seeing. And after 15 weeks of training like this, they retested both groups. And guess what? The individualized training group uh, improved their 10K performance more than the, the predefined group. And a key thing to note about this study is that they used nighttime PPG measurements to measure the HRV. So it's a clear indication that even though nighttime PPG measurements might not be the most accurate way to do it, it still has a lot of practical value. And when it's used correctly with the appropriate contacts around it, it can lead to improved performance. So ultimately, HRV tracking per se isn't the problem. The problem seems to be that the, the wearables and the apps that we use make it much more simplistic 
than what it actually is. It is actually a very complex number, which can be pretty hard to measure accurately and even harder to use that data to make educated uh, decisions. There are steps you can take to make the measurements more accurate. And there are pitfalls in data interpretation that you can prevent if you know about them. Sounds like you have done like really thorough research in, in HRE and uh, like w what's your conclusion? Is it something that you will use in your everyday life going, going forward and in your training? I think this research has also like shown me that it's not just a good metric for training. It's also a very good metric of like almost like your life quality, like how stressed are you, how your habits affect uh, your sleep, your like it, it, it tells you so much in just like this one number. But then, of course, it's very hard to uh, analyze the number to know like, OK, what was it that actually affected it? So we'll see. I'm still inconclusive, <laughs> but I, I want to measure it. I'm just not sure if I'm going to do night time or morning. Time. Yeah. Just a quick note, so it might seem like uh, Aura is not very good at tracking your HRV because it has these gaps sometimes in the data. But when I showed the clip to Marco, Marco pointed out that other wearables have those gaps or artifacts too, but they're just usually not transparent about it. In other words, Aura shows when there's bad data, but other wearables might just, you know, fill those gaps with arbitrary data that looks to be correct. And there's another problem with wearables nowadays. There is zero transparency in signal quality. So.